Again, welcome. And uh, there is a handout tonight if you have not received one. Um, Phil's handing them out. If you could just wave and let him know, he'll be sure that you get one. And we're going to do a lot of uh, a lot of jumping around tonight and looking at a couple of different stories. And uh, you can see on the screen behind me and on the handout that we're looking at the life of Simon Peter tonight and uh, looking at some lessons from his life. And this is one of my favorite Bible characters. And uh, I think he's one of my favorite because he is a lot like, or I'm a lot like him in some ways. Um, When we think of Simon Peter, we think of a person who always seems to kind of be getting himself in trouble. Maybe his heart's in the right place, but his, his, uh, his actions and his mouth, they just kind of get him in trouble. And uh, I think most men, at least, can relate to that, right? We know what that's like. And, and uh, so we're going to look at his life tonight and some lessons from his life. And uh, this is this is simple. This is kind of light, um, it, on the surface at least. But there are some real, real important things I think that we learn from looking at this man's life that that we can uh, be reminded of, and some things that we can uh, take from this and understand a little bit more, maybe about ourselves and our and our own walk with Christ and how we relate to the Lord. And, uh, that that is um, that's my hope and my aim for you tonight is that you will uh, look at this and say, yeah, I can identify with that. At least some of it, maybe not all of it, but at least some of it uh, will resonate with you, and you'll be able to uh, to learn more about your own response to God uh, from from Simon Peter. So we're going to start tonight in Matthew chapter four. So if you'll turn there, we're going we're gonna to look around at, at multiple places, as you can see on the handout, but also even more than what's listed here, um, there are some other places that we'll look to as well to, uh, to look at the life of Simon Peter. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, and while you're turning there, just um, let me remind you uh, of the, the services on Sunday and the, uh, the installation service. That's taking place at 9 and 11 for uh, Pastors Chad and Holly. And uh, we're, we're excited about that and uh, looking forward to that. So make sure that you're here Sunday, 9 or 11, and, uh, and be a part of that. We want, want everyone to come and, uh, and, and be, be here in prayer and, and, uh, and just seeking God for, for those services. So when you think about a person's life, and you think about what a person does, and, and oftentimes we do this when a person, uh, you know, unfortunately when they're at the end of their life or their life is over, we tend to look back and we say, well, okay, what do we learn about life from this person? How do, we, how do we learn how to live by the way that this person lived and by the way that this person did things? And oftentimes we do that with a relative, a family member, a friend, someone who's close to us, you know, that we, that we were around a lot and experienced a lot of. I know that when my dad passed away, um, you know, I spent some time reflecting on his life and things that I learned from him. And, and many of you in the room, you've had the same experience of, of losing a parent or, or both parents or a grandparent, someone close to you. And there's probably been that moment where you look back and say, I've really learned something from this person's life. I really learned the value of whatever, whatever it is that, you're, that you can think of. Um, for my dad, when he, when he passed away, uh, that became the basis of, his, of my funeral message for him, was all the things I learned from him. And uh, there, there was just a lot that I could, I could say about him. And so when we look at the life of a Bible character, we're looking at a life that we have oftentimes a a small window of. And in the case of Simon Peter, we meet him as a young man. 
Uh, for the first time in Matthew chapter 4, we meet him as a person who uh, has been born with the name Simon. We know that he's got some brothers, and we know that he's a fisherman, and we know that that's his life when we're introduced to him in Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to read that in just a, just a moment, but in the day in which Simon Peter lived, and the, the time period in which Jesus lived and came to, uh, to, to call on Simon Peter and his brothers to follow him, as we're going to read, a fisherman was was considered a, a sort of a rough life. It wasn't, uh, you know, they weren't, these weren't fishermen that had sponsors, you know, like you see on TV, they go out in the big boats and they've got the sponsor shirts on and they're, they're, they're not out there sport fishing. This was their life and their livelihood. And so they're, they're gruff and they're not always very clean and their language is pretty coarse and it's not, it's not the kind of life that was for everyone. And this is who Simon was. This is who his brothers were. Um, And and probably that's how they got the name, uh, his brothers, he and his brothers together, they get the name the Sons of Thunder. And and probably because they had had maybe a temper about them, a temperament that people would look at and say, you better stay away from those guys. You don't want to mess with them. They're They're not easy to get along with. And they're not easy to, uh, to, to connect with, and you don't want to say the wrong thing to them because it might not go so well for you. So this is the kind of life that we are introduced to when we, when we meet Simon Peter. And I say that and preference everything that we're going to say tonight because I want us to understand from the beginning that like most people that we read about and study and learn about in the Bible, there is no no requirement that we have a perfect life in order for God to use us. There's no requirement that we have a perfect life in order for God to call us, in order for God to love us, in order for God to uh, have any regard for us. And Simon Peter is, is a perfect example of that, of, of a man who was, who, as far as we know, was doing his best to make a living to provide for his family. He, he was married. We do know that. He was doing his best to provide and to, to make a living in a world and in an environment that was kind of harsh and difficult and depended on the season and the weather and depended on the temperament of the fish. You know, there's not a whole lot of predictability to what he was doing. And so he was just doing the best that he can. And so when we think about our lives... And we think sometimes, you know, I just don't feel like I measure up. I I wonder why it is that God regards me. Why does God even love me? Why does God care about me? What What does God see in me? I would say that we look at a life like Simon Peter and we begin to understand that it doesn't, it's not about what God sees in us as we are right now. It's about what God sees that we can become. And what God sees as the potential in us. And what God has placed within us as the potential. So let's look at some life lessons from Simon Peter. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 18. And I'm reading from uh, New King James. I may switch over a couple of times to a different version. But New King James is, is where I'm starting. And Matthew 4 and 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers... Simon called Peter, which he was not called Peter at this point in time, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called to them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. The first lesson that we learn from Simon Peter is that some things are worth leaving everything for. Some things are worth leaving everything for. I don't know what it must have been like to be on the Sea of Galilee that day, 
Maybe it was a hard day fishing. Maybe they, they just weren't biting. They weren't, or they weren't jumping in the net. And, and these fishermen were just, maybe the weather was bad. It was maybe cold, windy. We just don't know. But one thing we, knew, we do know is that there was something that happened that day in the lives of these fishermen that changed their world forever. There was something that they saw in this man called Jesus who walked up to them that compelled them to follow, to leave this life of theirs behind, to leave the thing that they knew that they possibly had been handed down from their own fathers. And we know that in the case of two of them, they were with their fathers. So this was kind of like a family thing. And they had this moment of clarity from God that was God-ordained. It was not by accident. It was not something that just kind of happened, that Jesus just happened to walk by where they were. This was done on purpose. This was done deliberately. This was a God set up, a God moment where it was known that that these men were going to be there and that God had a purpose and a plan for their lives and that Jesus would pass by and call to them and that they would respond and that they would answer. A moment of clarity. And maybe you've had a moment like that in your own life where you just knew that God was was nudging you to do something, that God was was telling you to do something that maybe you had had not ever thought of before. Maybe it was the moment in your life that you remember when you when you became a Christian, when you had that encounter with, with Jesus and you realized that you needed him and that you needed a savior. And it was this incredible moment where God called you and God, God reached into your life and said, I want you to join me. I want you on my team. I want you to do this for me. And it changes everything. It changed the tra- tra- trajectory of their lives that day. And Simon Peter was there among them. And all he had to do was listen to Jesus say, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I don't think Simon Peter understood what that really meant. I don't think he had any idea. I don't think it was the, I don't think there was the the, the words that compelled him. I think it was the spirit of the man that said those words that compelled him. I don't think Simon Peter or anybody else really understood what that meant. What do you mean fishers of men? Are we going to go round up people with nets? Are we going to go try to hook people with, with hooks? What does that mean? But it was this moment of clarity where they looked in the face of Jesus and they realized, yes, this person, this man is calling us to something higher, something better. And we're going to leave everything, everything we know, everything that is of value to us, everything that makes sense to us. We're leaving it behind so that we can go forward into the plan that God has for us. And that's a scary thing. When you know that God is asking you to do something that calls you, calls you to leave behind all that's familiar and all that you're, you look at and say, this is, this is what I know, this is my normal, it's a scary thing to do. But they did it because they understood, and Simon Peter understood, that some things are worth leaving everything for. And that leads us to the second lesson in Matthew chapter 14, if you'll flip over some time has passed Simon Peter has become with the others a disciple a follower of Jesus they've witnessed miracles they've heard teaching they have seen things happen that have astonished their minds and have made them uh, perhaps even scratch their heads they've had moments where they've disagreed moments where they've wondered you know where do I fit into all of this and we find that there's something else that happens. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 29, the second lesson that we find in the life of Simon Peter is that we is this, that don't, don't be afraid to take risk. Don't be afraid to take risk. Matthew chapter 14, verse 29, it says that Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, He walked on the water to go with Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. 
The story, you know, you're familiar with it, that Jesus uh, gets in the, in the boat with his disciples. They've just fed the 5,000. They've just fed the multitude. Um, John the Baptist has been beheaded, and they're kind of, in some ways, they're, they're in mourning, but yet I think in other ways they felt like maybe they were a little bit on the run, maybe a little bit hunted down, uh, wondering, could they be next? Could they be could they be uh, targeted next? And so they go into this big crowd, and Jesus is just trying to get to a deserted place. He wants to grieve for John the Baptist because this has, this has hurt him. It has, it has caused him pain, and the other disciples are all kind of confused. They've never really seen Jesus like this before. And then this great multitude comes in, and uh, some of them are sick, and some of them just have needs, and so... The, the real need that they had, though, at that, that time was food. And so this miracle takes place where, where the, the multitude is fed, and, and each, uh, each disciple takes up a, a basket, 12 baskets full or, or collected. They each have a basket, basically. And then Jesus says, all right, now, let's get out of here. And they got in the boat, and they began to, to go across the sea, and while they're there, there's this storm that comes up, waves and wind and, and rain and thunder and lightning. And they kinda, they've kind of gotten away from where Jesus is. They're separated a little bit, and, and they're, they're, the disciples are in a separate little boat, and, and they're, they're afraid of what's going on. And they look out, and they see this man walking across the water. And Jesus says to them in verse 27, be a good cheer. It's me. Don't be afraid. And this is where we pick up the story with Peter. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He's taking a risk. He's saying, okay, this is not normal. This is not the, the way that regular life works. People don't just walk on top of water. But if this is really Jesus, then he'll call me and I'll walk out onto the water with him and everything will be okay. He was taking a risk. And so Jesus says to him, come on, come on out in the water. And Peter comes down out of the boat, it says, and he walked on the water to go with Jesus. Now I want you to Think about this for a minute. He walked on the water. No doubt you've heard this story many times. You've heard it talked about and preached and all these kinds of things. But Simon Peter is taking a risk here. Going out in a storm in a boat is bad enough. But these men were fishermen. They could probably handle that. But getting out of a boat into the water in the middle of a storm is a different story. You can't swim in it. You can't. You can't find your way around. You can't tread the water because the water's just so choppy. This was a dangerous thing to do. But Simon Peter said, if that's really Jesus out there, then I want to go to where he is. He didn't ask Jesus to calm the storm. He asked Jesus, could I come and be with you in the storm? There's a big difference between the two things. You see, sometimes we want Jesus to come and just calm all the storm and make it all go away and fix it all so that we don't have to deal with it anymore. But there's a bigger lesson and a bigger, a bigger thing to be learned when we take a risk in the middle of the storm to go to where Jesus is and to, to, meet, where, to meet with the Lord in the middle of the storm. And that's what Simon Peter was doing. He was taking this holy risk where he was looking at the situation around him and saying, this isn't good. This doesn't look very hopeful and very promising. And it doesn't look like things are going to be okay. But I'm going to take this holy risk and I'm going to go to where Jesus is. And I know that if I just get to where Jesus is, that the storm's not going to matter anymore. What's happening around me isn't, isn't what's going to be my focus any longer. I just need to get to where Christ is. I just need to get to where he is. And the scripture is full of people who have been like this. We think about people like Esther, who was in the middle of a, of, of a storm of her own life and, and just her identity and who she was. 
and, and the, the task that she was put up to, not only as, as a Jew, but as a woman, and having the opportunity to save a nation. And so she says to, she says to her uncle, well, I guess I'll go. And if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish, because I'm here for such a time as this. And it's important for me to do and take this risk because it's what God needs from me and what I need from the Lord. We think about David who was, who was outnumbered and outsized by Goliath and he, he took it upon himself anyway to go out and meet the giant. We think about people like Gideon who, who God reduced what he had so that he could face the, the Philistines. And so he went and he did what God called him to do. He took that holy risk. And it's oftentimes in the middle of our storms that God will call us to take those risks. That God will look at us and say, okay, now's the time. You're looking around saying, what? Now, with all this going on, with all this chaos and all this difficulty and all this problem, now's the time that you want to call me to do this? But if we're waiting for that perfect moment where we say, okay, God, everything's just the way I want it to be right now. Everything's just the way that it needs to be. My life is all in order and it's fine and everything's good. So, okay, go ahead and call me. That's not how God typically works. He calls us in, a, in and out of our need, in and out of our, our struggle. And when those times come, the lesson that we can learn from Simon Peter is to not be afraid to take risks. And then the third lesson goes right into this. When you do try something new, believe in God's help. It's right here, verse 31. So Peter steps out in the boat. He sees that the wind is strong and he's afraid. He starts to sink. And he says, Lord, save me. And immediately, verse 31 says, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, verse 32 says, the wind ceased. And then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When you do try new things, believe in God's help. Now, Peter gets a lot of... He gets a lot of... Uh, not so good press here because we look at Peter and we say, oh, you know, Peter, he didn't have any faith and, you know, he should have just believed in God. He was right there with Jesus. What did he have to be afraid of? Why did he doubt? He started to sink and that's all it took was just one little, one. he got his ankles wet and all of a sudden he's just crying and saying, Lord, help me. And he should have just believed in God. Well, when's the last time you, how many of you been on a cruise? Okay, and next time you go on a cruise, jump off the boat and try, try that. See how it works for you. <laughs> the point is, he got out of the boat. He took the risk, and then his humanity took over, just like it would for any of us. It's one thing to say, yes, God, I'll do this. Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll make this happen. But then our humanity at some point takes over. And this, this flesh that's wraps, that wraps us up, and our mind, our mind comes in and starts to say, you've made a big mistake. Things aren't the way that they seem. And it's not as good as you thought it was going to be. And this isn't easy and it's tough, and it's hard. And we cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, save me. I've had those moments in my life where I've, I've said yes to God's direction. And then, not that far down the road, I've looked around and said, I don't know if I really heard that right. If I really understood that right. I'm not sure that this is really where God wants me to be. 
And if, if nothing else, maybe it's where God wants me to be, but I'm not really, really sure if it's where I want to be. And I've had those moments in my own life because when we take that risk, when we, we, we step out in, in that holy risk to what God is calling us to do, it doesn't just get easier all of a sudden. Sometimes it seems like things get worse. But great risk requires great faith. It requires us to trust in God through the process. And that's what Jesus was saying. He wasn't, he wasn't mad at Simon Peter by saying, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He was just saying, hey, I got you. You don't have to be afraid of this. You don't have to be fearful of what's going on. Just trust me. Just look to me. Let me help you. Let me, let me be with you in the middle of this storm and in this risk that you've taken. I'm here and I'm present. And thank God that he's, he's with us in those times and that he's there and that he looks past our humanity and says, it's all right. They're just being human again. They're just, they're just having this moment of, of, of humanity. He looks past that and he doesn't look at us and say, well, that, you're disqualified now. You're not going to do anything for me now because you had this moment of, of not trusting me. God doesn't do that. Amen. He looks at us instead and he says, okay, we're going to get through this. We're going to build your faith. You're going to grow from this. You're going to learn from this. And the next time you have this kind of storm, you'll be able to stand up. You'll be able to, to get through it. When you try new things, when you take that holy risk, believe in God's help. And that's what Simon Peter learned from this. He learned that he could believe in God's help and that God was going to be there. That great risk requires great faith. And what is great faith? It's not that we, we, we go to some faith uh, account and, and build and build and build. That's not what God requires of us. Great faith is a simple faith. It's a faith that just says, I know that God's going to see me through. I know that God's got me. It's trusting God with the outcome of our lives. That's what great faith is. So when you try new things, believe in God's help, have that great faith and possess it and let God do the work in your life. Number four, be careful what you promise. That's the fourth lesson in the life of Simon Peter. Be careful what you promise. Be careful what you promise. Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse 34. 31, rather. Verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And then he said, I, will, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times, or three times you will deny that you know me. Verse 33, he says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you. We go to prison together. We'll die together, whatever it is. I'm, I'm ready to go all the way with you. And he makes this, he makes this statement, he makes this, this vow, this, this promise to Jesus. And Jesus has already looked into the, into the matter. He already knows what's going to happen. He already, he already has insight that, that, Jesus himself could only have and he says Satan has asked for you Satan has a target on you he wants to sift you and, and separate you and get you all confused and all out of whack so that you're not whole anymore and that's his desire for your life then he says but I've prayed for you I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail 
And when you have returned to me, in other words, you're going to have some problems here. You'll strengthen your brethren. And that's when Peter makes his vow as promise. Be careful what you promise. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 5 tells us that it's better not to make a vow or a promise to God than it is to make a vow or a promise to the Lord and break it. It's better for us not to make a vow than it is to make a vow and to break it. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 37, the scripture says, Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just as simple as that. You know, if we're really looking for, for something practical here tonight, that's not just a spiritual lesson, although I think there's an important spiritual lesson here too. If we're just looking for practical, if we're looking for one way tonight that our world could be, could be a better place, it's this, if people would just keep their word. How many times have you had somebody tell you they're going to do something and then they don't show up, they don't call back, they don't, they don't do what they said they're going to do, they don't do it on time. You ever had that or am I the only one? I know that we, we're living in a time where there's, a, there's shortages of everything. But I've been waiting on a stove since November. <laughs> and I call the place. They say, oh, we'll call you back in two weeks. Two weeks roll around, no call. I, I call back, oh, oh, well, we're so sorry. We'll call you back in two weeks and give you an update. Two more weeks roll around and no call. You know, since November, been waiting on a stove. Now, just don't get all panicked. We have a stove. It's just not, it's it just in need of some repair. Some, some, it needs to be replaced. Not, it's not really repairable. But let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Think about all the areas of our lives. Those of you who are parents. How many times do your kids say, can I have, can I have, can I have? And we're like, well, not right now. We'll see about it later. And it just leads to the next thing. Or how many times have you said to your spouse, yeah, uh, we'll do that sometime. And then you hear about it. Well, we never did that. You said we'd do it sometime. We didn't do it. Let your yes be your yes. And let your no be your no. And what, what the Bible is saying with these scriptures is that we should be people of our word, that we should be people as believers who can be counted on, people who, if we say something, that it means something, that it has, it has value, and that people can look to it and say, that's a person that we can trust, and that's a person who believes what they're saying. That's a person who... who uh, is, is one that, that if, they, if they tell us something, we can trust it. And the world is lacking so much of that, that if we're just looking at this from a very practical standpoint, that's the lesson we could take from this, is just to be people of our word. But then we look at Peter and what, what's going on in his, his life. He's taking it deeper than that. He's making a, a spiritual commitment to Jesus that I'm going to go with you all the way to the end, that it's not going to matter what they do to me, that I'm with you, Lord. I am for you, and there's nothing that's going to, to get in the way of that. And it's, it's something that probably all of us have, have said in our, in our minds, or maybe out loud, we've said, you know, there, there's, there's absolutely nothing that could happen on this world that would cause us to have a, a faith that's shaken. Our faith is strong and solid, and, and you know, I'm, I'm firm in what I believe. But then the thing happens. And some of you know what I'm talking about. The thing happens. The tragedy, the, the situation, the season of your life comes, and all of a sudden you find yourself thinking, oh my goodness, I wonder 
Do I still believe it that way? Is it still true for me that way? Am I, am I really, do, do I really mean that? Can I really trust what I've said in the past? And it's in those moments that the thing that we have to focus on is not ourselves. It never should be anyway, right? But our focus should be on Christ. And see, that's what Peter was doing here. That's where he made his error. He said, Lord, I'm ready to do this. I can go with you. I got this. And Jesus was saying, no, you don't. Because you're relying on yourself. Because you're looking to yourself and you're, you're making this about you instead of about me. And Peter's heart was in the right place. He really was trying to do the right thing. But he was just a little bit off. And the lesson that we learn spiritually here is don't rely on yourself. Don't rely on who you are because in moments of, of trouble and difficulty and in and, 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 and moments of temptation, we all have the ability to fail and to falter and to, and to fall away and to leave. We all do. There's none of us that are immune to that. And so be careful what you promise. But more than that, be careful upon the, found, the, the foundation upon which you promise things. If you're promising something on your own strength, you're never going to be able to make it. But if you're promising something on God's strength, you got a shot. you got a chance. You've got, you've got a way to make it work. And that's what Peter needed to do here. He needed to rely on God's strength and not his own. Let's look at the rest of the story. In verse 47, it says, While he was still, still speaking, behold, the multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to, to Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said to him, Judas... Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those around saw him and saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike him with a sword? And one of the sons struck this one of and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And then we move on just a little bit. They go out, verse 54, into the into the court. They take Jesus into the high priest's house. And Peter is doing what? He's following at a distance. He's watching all of this. He's seeing what's going on. And he's remembering how he said to the Lord, Lord, I'm ready to go all the way to, to prison or die with you. And I would imagine that there's this sinking feeling in Peter's gut. Saying, you didn't mean that. If you meant that, you wouldn't be hanging back 50 yards. If you meant that, you wouldn't be watching all of this. If you meant that, you'd step up and do something. And there's this, this condemnation that starts to come in to Peter's life. And then they start coming around and they, they see him and this little girl, servant girl comes and says, this man, he, he was with them. This is one of them. And Jesus says, I don't, I don't know him. And then another one comes along in verse 58 and says, aren't you one of them? And Peter says, no, man, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this guy. I'm just watching. Then a little while later in verse 59, another person confidently affirmed, the scripture says, confidently says, I know that you're with him. I know that you're one of those disciples. And Peter said, I don't know what you're saying I have no idea what you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crows. And then in verse 61, it says, The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. A low point in his life. He's failed. He's messed up. He said things that he's finding out that he didn't really mean. And he's looking at this, and he's saying, oh my goodness, how will I ever recover from this? How will I ever 
get through this. And the lesson that Peter learns that, that night is that he's nothing if he relies on himself. He's nothing if he relies upon himself. He's got to rely on God's strength. He's got to rely on God's help. So how does he recover from this? How does he get through it? We know the story that, that Jesus is taken to be crucified and uh, he goes through... Before that, he's, he's beaten, and he's, he's walked up the, the road, the, the Via Della Rosa, all the way to the, to the cross. And he's taken to be crucified, and, and everyone's scattered, and everyone's just kind of, the disciples aren't together anymore. They're all afraid. Some are hiding. Some have run. Some have hung back. And then Jesus is taken off the cross, and he's put into a tomb. And everybody sort of leaves and wonders, okay, what's next? And we find John in John chapter 21, or not, not John, but Peter, excuse me, in John chapter 21, in verse 7. If you look, look there with me. They're out in the morning, and it says in, in chapter 21, I'm just going to back up just a moment to verse 3. That Simon Peter said to them, to the others who were around, I'm going fishing. And they said, to you, they said uh, well, we're going with you too. They went out, they got in a boat, and they didn't catch anything. I've always been fascinated by this this story, and in particular, I've always been fascinated by verse 3, where Simon Peter looks at the others and says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my old life. I don't know what to do anymore. We followed Jesus around. We, we witnessed all these miracles. We saw some incredible things, and then we saw it all fall apart. I don't know what to do any, anymore. I'm just going to go fishing. Now, I don't know if he went, he, he said he was going to go fishing to clear his mind. Maybe this was something that was kind of therapeutic for him. I don't know if that's what his intentions were. I don't think that, I don't think it was. I think his intentions were to go back to his old way of life and say, you know, I got to, I got to do something and this isn't working anymore. It's not going to work out for me to, to be a disciple any longer. There's no one to be a disciple to. So I'm just going to go back to my old way of life. And then we pick him up in verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. They've seen Jesus out. He's talked to them. And John says to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he heard it. He didn't see it. He heard. He put on his outer garment, for he had removed it. In other words, this man was just about unclothed. And he plunged into the sea. He puts on his outer garment. He's just heard that the Lord is close. All he does is he throws on his, his shirt real quick, and he jumps off the boat and into the sea. He's swimming to get to where Jesus is on the shore. I want you to get this. I really want you to get this mental picture. Okay, and if you need a little help, here's the help, okay? Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump's on the fishing boat trying to catch some shrimp, not having any success. Looks onto the dock, and there is who? Lieutenant Dan, and so Forrest Gump sees Lieutenant Dan, jumps off the boat, swims, and then the boat crashes into the shore, and it's a mess. But he just couldn't wait to get to where his friend was. And this is what I picture when I think about Simon Peter. He just couldn't wait to get to where Jesus was. The lesson here is be enthusiastic. Be enthusiastic in your, in your walk with Christ. Be enthusiastic in your, your, your ways with the Lord. 
He just couldn't wait to get to where Jesus was. He couldn't wait for them to maneuver the boat. He couldn't wait for them to pull the sail in. He couldn't wait for them to pull the nets in. He said, I got to get to where Jesus is now, so I'll just swim to where he is because I need to see him. And I need to, I need to be where he is. And so it says the other disciples came in the little boat. It says they weren't far from land. He could have just waited. Dragging the net with fish. As soon as they'd come to land, they saw the fire coals, and Jesus had, had lit a fire, and fish and bread were on the fire. And Jesus says, all right, come on. Let's have breakfast together. Let's, let's do this again. And all of a sudden, Peter's life has changed one more time. His, his experience with Christ is changed one more time. He has enthusiastically embraced Jesus again. And he's, he's, he's laid off all restraint, jumped into the water so that he could be where Jesus was. He didn't care what anybody thought. He didn't care, he didn't care how long it, it took. He didn't care that he was going to have to exert physical energy to get there. It didn't matter to him. He said, I just got to get to where Jesus is. And I'm telling you that sometimes in our walk with Christ, we could use that kind of enthusiasm. We could use that kind of 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 drive just to be to where to where God is and just to be driven by the things that 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 we love and that things that that God loves and it's it's like when we first come to Christ we're so excited and we're so we're so anxious and ready to do whatever we can for the Lord and over time it just seems that 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 our again our humanness kicks in and and that sort of gets lost but I want to tell you and encourage you today be enthusiastic about your walk with Christ. Let your enthusiasm for the Lord grow and be rekindled again. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. In other words, put everything you've got into it. Be enthusiastic about what you're doing and do it as unto the Lord. Whatever it is that you're doing, do it as if you're doing it for the Lord and for the sake of the Lord. And then the sixth lesson that we learn, number six, is make sure you understand the questions. Make sure you understand the questions. That same chapter, John chapter 21, verse 15, says that when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything there is to know. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you to the place you don't wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Just like you did in the beginning, follow me. Now he says, follow me. He's restored Peter. He's brought him back into full fellowship. He's, he's allowed him to, to sit with the reality of what happens. And the lesson here is make sure you understand what, what God is really asking for. God was calling him to deeper fellowship. God was calling him to deeper relationship. He was calling him to deeper service. He knew that Peter had said that morning, hey, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my old way of life. And Jesus says, now wait a minute, I'm going to interrupt this line of thinking. If you really love me, then you'll leave all this behind once and for all, and you'll just be sold out to me completely. And Simon, is, is, Simon Peter is not getting it. He said, I, you know, yeah, I love you. Of course I do. 
Jesus is saying, no, you don't understand. Do you really devote all that you are to me? Are you willing to, let it all, to lay it all down? You said earlier that you'd follow me to prison or to death. Are you really ready to do that? Sometimes we need to understand that God is calling us to deeper fellowship. Those moments where it feels like our, our lives are taking some kind of a turn or circumstances are coming and we feel like maybe we're being we're being tested or, prod, or prodded or nudged in a different direction or nudged to do something different that may not be may not have a question mark at the end of it we may feel like it's a question it may not be god asking us a direct question like like jesus was with peter but it's god's way of saying are you ready for deeper fellowship are you ready for a deeper walk with me are you ready to to go to a place where you've never been before and to do things you've never done before and are you ready to do that in my power and in my strength and that was the real question that god uh, that, that Jesus was asking Simon Peter that day. And then, number seven, our last lesson that we're going to focus on is that the Holy Spirit really does make a difference, it should say. It doesn't say that, but it should say make a difference in how you live. The Holy Spirit really does make a difference in how you live. Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. The disciples and others have gathered in an upper room at the command of Jesus. Jesus has said that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to all the uttermost parts of the earth. And then in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we see that promise come to fulfillment on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit falls in an upper room and those 120 disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit and that's the, the presence of the Holy Spirit is, is evident in multiple ways, but one of the ways that it's evident that day is that they begin to speak with other tongues and then they leave that room and they go out into the streets and people hear them speaking with other tongues. And they say in verse 8, How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And they're listening to them and they're hearing wonderful things about God being spoken. And these 120 are just, just doing what, what the Lord has led them to do that day. And they're, they're obedient and they're yielding themselves to the Holy Spirit and they're, they're speaking in other tongues and they're, they're, they're entering the streets and the power and the witness of the Holy Spirit. And some people are listening and they're saying, this is just amazing what they're saying about God. And then you've got the people on the other, other hand who are saying, no, they're just drunk. They've just had too much to drink. But then we find that somebody stands up and tries to bring it all to clarity. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, verse 14, raised his voice and said to, the, to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now remember, Simon Peter was a fisherman, gruff and rough and Probably not educated, certainly not, not educated in, in the, the ways of the temple. He had, of course, been with Jesus for a few years and had learned quite a few things from him. But here he is quoting scripture. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I'll show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon and the blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's Peter, this gruff, rough fisherman who's, who's made all kinds of errors and 
has, has said all kinds of things that he probably wishes he could take back and has acted rash at times and has, has, appeared, has appeared to just kind of be sort of a loose cannon, is standing up on the day of Pentecost and he's saying to a crowd of people that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a life and what a turnaround for this man. And it's all because he's yielded himself, not just on this day, but time after time after time, he's yielded himself to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and he's now yielded himself to the, to the, the control of the Holy Spirit, and it really does make a difference in how he lives. And he goes on to, to finish his sermon. He talks about Jesus, and it says that he said many other things, that when it was all said and done, that there were those in the crowd who received his word and that were baptized, and 3,000 people were added to the believers in one day. The Holy Spirit empowering an ordinary man, a man who, again, had made lots of mistakes, a man that I can look at and say, i I can identify with him. The blunders that he's made. Stands up, preaches a short little sermon. 3,000 people fall under conviction, accept Christ, and are added to the church. And then they go out and they tell others, and they tell others, and they tell others. And it spreads and it moves, and it's the beginning of the church as we know it today. History tells us that Simon Peter was crucified on a cross, his arms stretched out. He was well into his 80s when this happened. Crucified for his faith and his testimony in Jesus Christ, they stretched him out on a cross, and he refused to be hung upright. He was hung upside down on a cross because he said, I'm not worthy to die the same death that Jesus did. Amen. He was hung upside down. Jesus said, you'll be taken where no one wants to go. Your arms will be stretched out. It all came true. It all came to pass. But not before this incredible life saw the birth of the church, the establishment of the church, his leadership in the early church, and his continued witness of Christ to as far as the world could take him at that point in time. An incredible life, and I hope that you leave tonight learning something, encouraged by something, reminded of something about your own walk with Christ that will spur you to, to live better for Him. Let's stand together. Pray with me one more time as we leave. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that there are people that we can look to in the Bible who teach us so much, who show us what it is to live for you. Sometimes there's people in the Bible that we can look to and it's almost like looking in a mirror and seeing a reflection of ourselves. And God, you put those people there to encourage us. You put those stories there to instruct us and to show us that we can make it. That if they can make it with your help, then we can make it too. And I pray tonight that we would leave encouraged and that we would leave inspired to live for you and to walk with you closely and to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit every day to lead us and guide us and to help us to make a difference. Go with us tonight. Go uh, before us and keep us well and safe. I pray and let, let us come back Sunday ready to worship you and give you our best. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Have a wonderful evening.